call her and just just let her know that we miss her, that somebody other than the pastor missed you. Because everybody expects the pastor to go see him, you see, because after all, he's the shepherd. But th that's not the way it's supposed to be because we're all part of the body. Amen? Amen. 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 You know, we're not supposed to be the function at 100% of Mother Perry in here. Amen? Amen. Right. Now, if you said amen, then I expect you to call her. And, and if you can't go visit her, if you got a car, amen? Amen. Oh, I got quiet. <laughs> this week will be part two of the series. God is still in control. Yes. If you were with us last week, you know that we started this series out, which is God is still in control. Well, the purpose of this series is to expose the enemies. Yeah, that's right, the enemies. You do have enemies. And I'm not talking about your boss. I'm not talking about the person that looks at your look at your, your, your husband and winks their eye. I'm not talking no, oh, no, I'm not talking about that. You have an enemy. We need to expose that enemy throughout the series. Uh, that we all must go to war with as a believer of Jesus Christ. So the purpose of this series is to expose our adversary, yes. our enemies, yes. that we all must go to war with as a believer of Jesus Christ. Yes. Did you know that exposure is crucial? Yes. Exposure is imperative. It is highly important because it is impossible to win a battle against an enemy that you do not know. It is impossible to win a battle against an enemy that you do not know. You see, when we all came to God, uh, all we knew at the time was that I am a sinner. Uh, I'm convicted by my sins by the Holy Spirit's ministry. And I, and I need Jesus in my life so that I don't go to hell and that I can have eternal life. You see, that's about all it was at the time of conversion. You see, nobody told us that giving our life to Jesus was just the starting point. For many of us, giving our life to Jesus was more like an accomplishment than a requirement. I'm going to say that again. For many of us, giving our life to Jesus was more like an accomplishment rather than a requirement. You see, nobody informed us that there would be battles to fight. You see, they shared some nice, feel-good testimonies with me, but they failed to tell me about the test. They told me at the time when I came to Jesus that I was a new creation in Christ Jesus. But, but, but the funny thing about that was I still had behaviors and old habits and old thoughts uh, that didn't fall in line with this new life of following Jesus. You see, the children of Israel were in a similar situation where God had delivered them, God had saved them from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Is that right, Miss D? 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Just like the Lord has delivered you and I and saved you and I from a life of slavery from sin. And once God brought his people out of being slaves in Egypt, he began to teach and test his people, Amy, in order for them to understand how to live in freedom. I'm going to say that again. Once God brought his people out of being slaves in Egypt, he then began to teach and test his people in order for them to understand how to live in freedom. And I'm here to tell you, my brothers and sisters, that God does the same thing with his people today. You see, once God brings you out of a lifestyle of sin, he puts his spirit in you and begins to teach us and test us through our everyday living and through the choices we make. 
I'm going to say that again. This is this we're going to be teaching today. Not too much whooping and hollering. You see, once God brought you out of a lifestyle of sin, he puts his spirit in you and begins to teach us and test us through our everyday living and through the choices that we make. And since the Lord has freed us from the slavery of sin, we are free to choose who and what we are going to serve. Since God freed you, Amy, you are now free to choose who and what you will serve. You see, some of us will hear that free part and think that that means we're free to live however we want. But God says this in his word. Some of you may say we are free to do anything that we want to do. But not everything is good for you to do. You may say we are free to do anything. But not everything helps you to be strong as a believer. My brothers and sisters, Paul sympathizes with that verse in scripture. And he says in Romans 6 verse 16. Don't you know that if you offer to be someone's slave, you must obey that master. Either your master is sin or your master is obedience. Letting sin be your master leads to death. Letting obedience be your master leads to God's approval. Mm. You know, I was thinking as God was giving me this message, Gina, I was thinking that just the fact alone that we are free to make a choice should make some of us stand up and shout because for some of us, before Jesus found us, Just the fact that you are able to make a choice. Some of us ought to be up on our feet praising God and thanking him. Because before Jesus, I don't know about you, but before Jesus found me, I was addicted to stealing. I was addicted to lying. I was addicted to cursing. I was a slave to sex. I was a slave to alcohol. I was a slave to unrighteousness. Righteousness. I was governed by my emotions. But now that I'm free to make a choice, I am free to choose. I'm free. How many of us know that with freedom comes responsibility? You see, with freedom pops comes responsibility. You see, contrary to popular belief, freedom isn't free. <laughs> isn't that like an oxymoron this morning? You hear freedom, you would think that it's free, but to the contrary of our popular belief, freedom is not free, Miss Yolanda. Can you, can you believe that? You see, in America, we experience certain freedoms, you see? We got the freedom of speech, the freedom of press. We have the freedom of religion. We have the freedom of a fair trial. We have the freedom to marry whoever you want. You see, these freedoms that we experience may be free for you and I, but some brave people that you and I have never met to pay for these freedoms with their natural lives. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. In the same vein, the salvation that we have, the new life that we walk in, the forgiveness of our sins, the eternal life that we have, it may be free to us, but never forget this one truth. It wasn't free. It was paid for by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Judges chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Judges chapter 3, verses 1, concluding in verse 6. 
and we're reading to where the children of Israel, since that God delivered them out of the slavery and bondage of Egypt, he took them for 40 years through the desert. Upon completing that time in the wilderness, they now had reached the, 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 the doorway of the promised land. And God is giving them some, some direction and some clarity in Judges. He's telling them some things. And because they, did, they didn't obey God, we're going to listen to God's response to their disobedience. Judges chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, concluding in verse 6. Let's stand for the reading of God's word this morning. Let there be light this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. I need a reader this morning. Who can, who can read it for me this morning? Hold on one second. Is there, if you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not there, say wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> Done. Okay. Mm -hmm. Louder. Louder. These are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites who had not had previously battle experience. The five rulers of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidians, and the Hivites living in the Lebanon mountains from Mount Baal Hermon to Lebo Hamath, they were left to test the Israelites to see whether they would obey the Lord's commands, which he had given their ancestors through Moses. The Israelites lived among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. They took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. Father God, we thank you this morning for the work that your word is doing by faith right now as it's traveling through the souls and hearts and minds of your people, Father. I thank you this morning for the challenges that your word imposes upon us this morning. I thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that it gives us. I thank you, Lord, that your word swells up our faith this morning, that we can respond to it in a courageous way. I, I pray, Father, that your word would strengthen our spiritual backbones, Lord, so that we can walk, Lord, that we can walk in the way that you have ordered us. We thank you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Somebody say Amen. 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 You may be seated. Hallelujah. Keep it on. If we can remember um, to keep a uh, um, uh, ministry event, keep her lifted up in prayer and as well as um, I'm pretty sure you all know about um, uh, former President uh, Donald Trump, he was an um, assassination attempt. Keep him up in prayer, too, as we are commanded to pray for our leaders, uh, President Biden and, and so forth. So, amen. Whether you like him or not, God gave a commandment. So if you don't like it, good riddance, it's his world. If you don't build your own world, and you don't have to do it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Last week, we exposed... <laughs> One of Israel's most nagging enemies, which was the Philistines. Mm -hmm. They were an aggressive tribal uh, uh, group in the southwest portion of the promised land. They were a nation that God's people would battle for a long time. We went over what the meaning or the name Philistine means which is wallowing or to wallow self. The dictionary says that wallowing means to roll about in or to give oneself over to or to revel in a feeling or a way of life. An example of wallowing could be wallowing in self-pity, wallowing in self-doubt, wallowing in the mud as pigs do. You see, the Philistines represent the God of self. They represent the flesh. And as I was putting um, this uh, word together, I was wondering why the Philistines were the first on the list. 
But may I suggest to you on this morning this quote to the reason that the Philistines were mentioned first. Before you can do battle with any other enemies in your life, you have to deal with self. Before you can battle what's going on on Wall Street or Congress, you have to deal with self. Before you can worry about what the community is doing, what Pookie and Ray Ray is doing, you need to make sure that you got self in order. Because if you're in bondage to self, your adversary, the devil, won't waste time or his time on you because you're what they would call self-checked. Anybody that played basketball know what self-check is. Um, uh, see, it, I guess that wouldn't happen to me. Maybe that happened to somebody who couldn't shoot. But if you couldn't shoot the ball in the hoop, instead of somebody guarding you, they would walk away from you, right? Because they would say, you're going to miss anyway. You're self-checked. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. See, we don't want to be self-checked. You see, the Bible tells us that there were five lords of the Philistines. Those five lords can represent our five senses, which are touch, taste, hear, see, and smell. And these five represent our flesh. Okay? Now, if we are not able to keep our own flesh in check, the Philistines, <laughs> that's our flesh, we don't have to worry about the other enemies, the Hivites, the Canaanites, the Amorites, and all the otherites. If we cannot keep the flesh in order, we deal with this Philistine or this God of self or flesh like Paul had stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. Paul says this. This is how he keeps his flesh in order. He said, but I discipline my body and keep it under control. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Mm -mm -mm. Uh -huh. To keep self in check. We need self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Ain't that right, Eric? You see, we must cooperate with God's Spirit in us. And as we read God's Word, the Spirit helps us live in agreement with the Word of God. I'll say that again. We must cooperate with God's Spirit in us. And as we read God's Word, the Spirit helps us live in agreement with God's Word. Our next enemy or adversary that we will take a look at for today is the Canaanites. The Canaanites. The Canaanites were a people who had become extremely corrupt. They had become extremely corrupt by the time God brought his people to their doorstep. And because of their corruption, God commanded for them to be utterly destroyed. God knew that if the Canaanites were not wiped out completely, they would become a corrupting influence to his people and lead them to practice ungodly ways. Footnote. Do not let anyone fool you. Bad people can make those who want to live good become bad. Yes, yes, yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Do not let anyone fool you. Bad people can make those who want to live good become bad. You see, for centuries, the Canaanites practiced 
all types of gross sexual immorality, which included all forms of incest. There was brothers with, with, with sisters, nieces with nephews. Uh, uh, uh. They had all forms of incest. They had all forms of homosexuality and bestiality, which is sex with animals. They also engaged in the occult. They engaged in witchcraft, voodoo, mysticism, white magic, wizardry, and devil worship. They were hostile toward their parents, and they offered their children as sacrifices to the god Molech, in which they burned their children to death. The Canaanites were handed over by the commandment of God to total destruction. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 16. Listen to the voice of the Lord. However, in the cities of the nations the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, do not leave alive anything that breathes. Do not leave alive anything that breathes. Wives, Children, chickens, donkeys, cattle, men, senior citizens, wiped out. In this total destruction, God's people were to make no treaties, they were to show no mercy, they were to cut no plea deals, they were to make no compromises or intermarry with these Canaanites. God made it clear that the Canaanites were different from all the other nations. You see, and, and I start wondering why they were different. And God starts showing me through the word and the verses that he were taking me that they were not different just because they worshiped other gods. Mm -hmm. They were not different because they were sinful. Because all of that was true with the other nations, even including Israel at times. They were not different just because they worshiped other gods, you see. But what made them different was the extent of their sin. What made them different, Pops, was their cultural approval of their sin and rebellion. What made them different, Miss Yolanda, it was their unwillingness to relent or repent of their sin. You see, the Canaanites as a whole culture committed sins of idolatry. They committed sins of holy temple prostitution, of, of adultery, of homosexuality, of incest, of murder, of bestiality, of gang rape, and child sacrifice. You see, and there were other nations that also participated in some of these practices. But not like the Canaanites, my God. You see, with, with the Canaanites, it was a widespread involvement and acceptance of these sins. This is what brought the Canaanites under God's judgment. Make no mistake about it this morning. These sins exist in every culture, then and even now. But even now, they are outlawed by most governments, and they are socially condemned by the majority of the people in the culture. But, however, with those Canaanites, with their culture, these sins were pretty much universally practiced and accepted because this is what their gods liked. And instead of aligning their lifestyle to God Almighty, they made gods that agreed with their lifestyle. Instead of aligning their behavior and lifestyle to God Almighty, they decided to make gods that would agree with their lifestyle. Not only did they declare these acts as righteous morally, they also participated in these acts as a form of worship of their gods, as a way of gaining approval to their gods. 
Why did I tell you all that? What, what, what does that have to do with 2024? I'm glad you asked. My brothers and sisters, the Canaanites represent the sin that you're cool with. I'll say that again. The Canaanites represent the sin that you're cool with. May God forgive us. I'm not talking about the sin that you stumble into. No, I'm not speaking of the sin that you fight with on a daily basis. I'm speaking of the sin that you're cool with. I'm talking about the sin that you used to commit and felt convicted for. Then you would ask God for forgiveness. But now you've been doing it for so long, going back and forward with committing the sin, asking God for forgiveness, walking in freedom to being tempted, committing the sin, getting convicted, asking for forgiveness and walking in freedom and doing it again and again and again like a cycle. Now that you have gotten to a point to where you don't even ask for forgiveness when you do it, this is a dangerous point to be at. Check out what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. Thank you, baby. Listen to what the wisest man in the world said in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11 because God does not punish sinners instantly people feel it is safe to do wrong because God does not punish sinners instantly people feel it is safe to do wrong Solomon says You've been doing the same sin for so long that you start to feel as if there are no consequences for my sin. This mindset here sets in silently. If God isn't punishing me for my sin, he understands. That's what it is. God understands. He understands how hard it is. He understands the, the road I walk is difficult. He understands. And you know what? I'm going to be honest with you this morning. You know what? You're absolutely right in saying that God understands. You're absolutely right. Because unfortunately, it is not God that don't understand. It is us who don't understand. Paul says in Romans chapter 2 verse 4, God has been very kind to you. And he has been patient with you. God has been waiting for you to change. But you think nothing of his kindness. Perhaps you do not understand that God is kind to you. So that you will change your hearts and lives. But when you have got a Canaanite in the land. Or when you're cool with your sin. At this point. You begin to justify your Canaanite. Justify your sin. That's just the way I am. You excuse your Canaanite with your works. I read my Bible. I go to church. I talk to God. I give to the church faithfully. You rationalize your Canaanite with everybody's dealing with something. Nobody is perfect. As long as we live, we're going to sin. You minimize your Canaanite with I only do it once a week. I only touch it once a month. Or not even at all. You offer protection to your Canaanite by trying to keep it discreet, hiding the Canaanite or the sin from the public. 
And just as God was kind to the Canaanites, just as he was patient with the Canaanites, he waited for them to change their ways, exercising his forbearance with them. Why? Because it is not God's will that none should perish, but all come to the saving grace he offers through Jesus Christ. The Lord has been patient with us. So that leads me to my last and final question. 12 o'clock on the dot. I'm doing good. <laughs> Why would God allow these sins to persist? If they're so bad, well, and, and you know, and I'm, uh, and, 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 and trust me, I had to preach this to myself. So before you're sitting here like we're in a dentist's office all quiet, I was quiet as I was, God was ministering it to me. So this is for us. It ain't for just you. Why would God allow these sins to persist? That's a heck of a question, huh? Well, let's stay in the text. For the same reason he did for Israel, to test and to teach. Verse 2. Verse 2 says this in Judges chapter 3, verse 2. Read verse 2 for me again. Judges, the first, you read Judges 3, 1 through 6? Okay, I'll get it. <laughs> verse 2 says, he did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites who had not had previous battle experience. He did this only to teach warfare to the descendants of the Israelites who had not had previous battle experience. What are you saying? May I suggest to you on this Sunday morning that the same way God left the Canaanites in the land to teach warfare to the Israelites, he has left those sins you're cool with to teach you how to fight. The same way God left the Canaanites in the land to teach warfare to the Israelites, he has left those sins you're cool with to teach you how to fight. Now you're looking for an example to bring this home. Okay, let me, let me get in my own business so y'all can have barbecue preacher a little bit. So when I was in grade school, obviously I was short if I'm only 5'7 now, so don't laugh. <laughs> when I was in grade school, I was short, right? I didn't have cousins that went to school, went to my school. At least I didn't know them at the time. And so the other kids that were bigger would pick on me. They would call me names and talk about my clothes. They would, uh, 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 they would like punch on me and stuff, right? And 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 back then it was one through eight, so you had to go to different rooms. And so they would, the bigger kids would charge me lunch, my lunch money, to get to my classrooms. So each and every Monday through Friday, I had to choose. <laughs> I had to choose. My choice was eat lunch and get beat up. Or go hungry and not get beat up. Those were my choices. I was getting pumped in so many words. I was getting pumped. You know why I was getting pumped? Because I did not know how to fight. But something happened. One day, I was really hungry. And I didn't eat breakfast. And this one kid, Harry, Harry Billingsley, still remember his name. And if you're watching Harry, please forgive me. I've already asked for it already, but forgive me again. <laughs> Harry Billingsley. I had got my lunch, and I was going to sit down and eat it. And he walks up, he digs in his nose, and he touches my sandwich and says, Do you want this? My gut was growling. And I was tired of being tired. I was tired of being pumped. I was tired of being picked on. I was tired of being bullied. And I was tired of being hungry. So I took my fork and stuck it in his hand. And I never had to worry about Harry or other bullies anymore. Ooh, hallelujah. <laughs> 
And you know what? I ate lunch that day. Amen. And every day after that, I ate lunch. What does that have to do with us and the Canaanites? Well, when you get tired of being pumped, when you are tired of being bullied by that sin you're cool with, when you're tired of being picked on by that sin, God is teaching you how to fight. How do you fight a Canaanite? Say you're tired. And I'm ready to fight. I'm tired of doing the same thing over and over again. How do I deal with this Canaanite? How do I fight the sin that I'm cool with? Acts chapter 3 verse 19. And it reads the following. Repent. Then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. <clears throat> Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. That was sounded easy. All I have to do is repent. Repent literally means to change the way you think. Change the way you think about the sin you're cool with. See, you change the way you think about your Canaanite. What does that mean? You stop lying about it. What does that mean? Sometimes we say, you know, I'm really struggling with this alcohol. Stop, I really hate it. No, you don't. You don't hate it. You hate the results of it. We need to be honest. I like cigarettes. God, no, I don't. I despise the nicotine. Oh, I can't stand what it does. No, quit lying and get honest with God. God, change the things I like. I like them, and I know your words say don't pollute the temple. Change the things I like. Change my likes into dislikes, God. Hallelujah. We have to get honest with yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah. Some of us, oh, I'm fighting. How are you fighting? And you're wallowing in it. That's not a fight. How do we? We have to hate it. Can I ask you a question? Who in there has kids? Everybody got kids? Mm -hmm. Who don't have kids? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. My sons are adults. They're you not have kids. kids. <laughs> They're not children. They're adults. Okay. Let's, 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 let me show you what I mean by hate. Let's say, let's say your son goes in the store, kill four people. Let's just say. Now, you're on the jury. You're on the jury. Could you convict him for capital punishment? Could you convict her of capital punishment, the death sentence? My daughter? No. I have more Why not? Because I love her. She's my child. Did you hear what she said? Instead of, see, you missed it. You missed it back there. You cannot properly go to war with something you don't hate. Wow. She, it wasn't that the daughter wasn't guilty. It was because there's a relationship. There's a love there. And you, and you can't properly execute Justice yes. on something you love. Yes. So once we change the way we think about it, Romans 12, verse 2, he says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why, Paul? Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
How do you deal with the Canaanite? All of us have some Canaanites. Whether it's gossip, whether it's drinking, whether it's a bad language, whether it's doubting, whether it's a, 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 a lust, we have sins that we're cool with. But God puts us in a state today to where we can honestly be honest with them. That don't mean we write them out on the board here. God is calling us to a, to a, a, a portion of life to, to be honest with them. If you don't hate your sin, ask God to give you the, the desire to hate it so that we can change the way we think, repent and say, God you said, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of my mouth I agree with what you said and I'm going to, and help me to not to not allow it to come out of my mouth God, you said not to pollute my temple, my, te my, my, te my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit start coming in agreement with what God says get out of agreement with what you think with every justification with every minimization get out of agreement with those things I know it's going to be quiet tonight that's why I'm getting out of here Father God I just